Our first operator is named after Melvin Fitting, a logician who worked at the City University of New York. Now at the time, the idea was to extend the immediate consequence operator from positive to normal logic programs and with it to drop the restriction on positive body literals but also to take negative body literals into account. Now how to do that? Well, we more or less have everything at hand given that we have already studied program completion. And indeed the idea is now to take the conditions expressed by program completion formulas to guide the design of an operator. And more or less what this operator should do is summarized in these two bullets here. Now the operator should assign true to an atom if this atom appears as the head of a rule whose body was found to be true. And conversely, the operator should assign a false to an atom if all bodies of the rules that have this atom in the head have been found to be false. That's more or less the idea. Now, okay, it's an idea, it's a bit hand-waving. Let's actually make this a little bit more precise. You may remember program completion. It actually uh, results in a set of equivalences. And such an equivalence then says that uh, an atom is true if and only if one of the bodies of the rules that have this atom in the head has also been found to be true, right? So we have a disjunction and this means there should be one rule that has this atom in the head whose body was found to be true. And indeed more or less this condition here can be read just as, as, as the, uh, just by rereading that A is true if we have a rule where that has this atom as its head and it was found to be applicable. Okay, good. Now let's examine the second condition. Well, a priori we are, we are faced with the same, with the same um, equivalence. However, keep in mind that we can uh, turn this equivalence into an equivalent equivalence by negating both sides of it. So this formula is then equivalent to not A is equivalent to the right hand side. Well, what does it say? It says, well, an atom is false if and only if all bodies of rules who have this atom in the head have been found to be false, right? And more or less, in the same way we can, we can, we can more or less justify this phrase here by this formula, is once we found out that all rules that have A in their head have been found to be false, inapplicable, this means actually there's no way to derive A and A can safely be turned turn into false or be assigned the truth value of false. Okay, well there's one little uh, well subtlety here that we also should not drop, drop and this is keep in mind that we now deal with normal logic problems. So what does it mean that a body is true or a body is false? Actually for a body to be true this means that all positive body literals must have been found to be true and all negative body literals must also been established to be false. So this must have been established and then it's, it's safe to apply the rule, right? On the other hand, for a body to be false, it's enough that there is one positive body literal that has been refuted, that has been found out to be false, or one negative body literal that has been found out to be true already. So a counterexample is enough and then the body uh, has been established to be false and the rule is inapplicable. And if this is the case with all the rules that if A in the head, then A must be false. Okay, good. I think this more or less captured the intuition and made a bit the, the relation to uh, the formula of program completion. Let's now actually look at the real definition of the fitting operator. The fitting operator of a normal logic program P maps one partial interpretation into another partial interpretation. So this is here the input partial interpretation. Keep in mind that T stands for the set of true atoms and F for the set of false atoms. And the result of the um, fitting operators then composed of applying two other operators, one that gives us the new true and the other that gives us the new uh, false atoms. Now let's look at one, uh, one of them after the other. First of all, this is now the extended TP operator, right? 
which uh, collects the head of all rules whose positive body literals are among the true atoms and whose negative body literals are among the false atoms. This corresponds more or less one to one to the first bullet on the previous slide. Now the second operator tells us which atoms should be as, or are assigned false in view of the input, right? So it collects all atoms among the atoms in the program for which all rules that have this atom in the head have been found out to be inapplicable. And inapplicable means that either a one positive body literal has been found to be false or a negative body literal has been found out to be true. And if this is the case for all rules with A in the head, then there is no way to derive A and we add A to the false atoms. Okay, and that's it. And this guy gives us the fitting operator and uh, we abbreviate it in what follows with this phi of P. Okay. Good, now that you have the definition, let's actually see it in action on an example. So here's again our good old running example from the previous part. You may remember that this uh, program has two stable models, A and C and A and D, while it has a third spurious supported yet unstable model that contains A, C and E. Okay, now this is actually not so important because I don't want to compute models now and just actually see the operator at work. Hence, I just picked a random uh, partial assignment and apply the operator to it. So my assignment uh, makes A true and D false. And now we'll see actually what results uh, from applying the operator to this partial assignment. So here it is. So what we do is we more or less go over the, the atoms or the rules in the program. Of course, whenever there is a fact, it must be true in the result, right? Because the fact is a rule that always uh, uh, applies, hence A must become true, right? And given that we have A uh, in the input, that we assume that A is true, this rule here is um, inapplicable. And since it's the only rule that provides us with B, there's no way to provide B, hence B is added to the false atoms. Okay, given that we, that we assume that A is true and D is false, this rule here applies and allows us to derive C, which is then added to the true atoms. And uh, on the other hand, since we neither know about the status of C nor E in the input, we cannot say anything about this rule the only rule about D, so we, can't, we can neither say that D should be true nor false, right? Hence we have to leave this unknown. So finally, the two rules with E. Again, in our input, right, we know nothing about E, we know nothing about B and F, hence we cannot say anything about E. Hence E has no, is neither true nor false in the result. Okay, last but not least, don't forget that there's also the atom F. And uh, so F has, well, there is no rule that has F as a head atom. Hence, trivially, all rules with F in the head are inapplicable. And hence, the second condition of the fitting operator applies and F is set to false. Keep in mind that in, in program completion, uh, we would obtain that F is equivalent to false. And it's the same type of reasoning, right? So here, F is set to false. Okay, I don't want to go now through the other steps in detail. Perhaps this is a moment for you to pause the video, look what comes next. That's actually the next result. And then there is another one. And then actually you can stop because the operator starts to os oscillate because the result that you get here is the same as the input of this. So this will actually keep oscillating in this, in this, um, in this case here, right? Good. So anyway, this was just to illustrate a bit the working of the operator. Again, pause the video, go through the second and the third step a, a bit by yourself. And now let's actually look what we can do with this operator and how we can use it properly. Before delving further into the fitting semantics and the properties of the fitting operator, uh, let me stress that the whole development that we do now is analogous to that of the TP operator, where we define the TP operator, iterations of the TP operator, that then the fixed point of this actually gave us the consequences of the positive logic program, etc., etc. So what we do now is 
Again, analogous to that, hence I will also be brief and not provide that many explanations because after all, they will be redundant uh, with what we did before with the TP operator. So in case you doubt it, just go back and check it out. Okay, first thing to define is, now that we have the operator, how can we iterate it? Again, we do this with this uh, with iterative variants, right? So if the zeroth iteration of the TP operator means we do not apply the TP operator, we only project the input onto the output, right? Okay, whenever we want to define the I plus first iteration, it means that we apply the operator onto the ith uh, iteration. And in this way, we have a bunch of uh, uh, iterative variants of the operator. Okay, and again, analogous to how we define the consequences of a program, we now define the fitting semantics, just to give it a name, as the partial interpretation that is obtained by unioning all iterative variants that start from the partial interpretation where everything is still unknown. And this more or less is a is this partial interpretation can be used to give semantics to logic programs and that was done at the time as one possibility uh, and this is now uh, the fitting semantics and it's analogous to the consequences of a positive logic program in this restricted in this restricted setting okay let's have a look at an example first for computing the fitting semantics of our running example, we start from the empty interpretation, that is the partial interpretation that assigns unknown to all variables, and then we apply the fitting operator iteratively until we reach a fixed point, that is until uh, nothing changes anymore. In our small example, this happens after three iterations where we get a fixed point and from then on actually all the iterations produce the same value. Accordingly, this fixed point equals the union of all uh, iterations that we obtain from the empty set. So, what does the fitting semantics tell us? It tells us that A should be true, B and F should be false. Well, I guess this is, this, this is what we expect. However, what it cannot produce, it cannot tell us that E must be false. However, that does not come really as a surprise, because after all, the fitting uh, semantics, the fitting operators, follows the principles of program completion. And also program completion could not provide us with this information. And you may actually remember that um, there are three models of the completion of this program and they are the three supported models. And there is this supported yet unstable model that makes uh, A and C and E true, right? And well, so this is not really a surprise that the fitting semantics cannot determine that E must be false. Okay, uh, let's just summarize with a few properties of the fitting semantics. So first of all, the iterative variants are monotonic, right? So at each stage you get more true and false uh, atoms. And after all, the semantics as such can never produce a conflict and in general does not yield a total uh, interpretation, right? So normally you end up with a partial interpretation as we have seen, right? Where you can't decide, in our case, you, we cannot decide C, D and E. Okay, so this is more or less just this little excursion to the fitting semantics. What we're really interested in, after all, is the fittings operator. Just as the consequence operator for positive logic programs, the TP operator, also, the fitting operator, but now for normal logic programs, is monotone. And you may actually remember from the discussion on the TP operator in the part on computation that once an operator is monotone, we can draw on a lot of results from the literature that relate actually the, the fixed points of the operator and how one can compute, for instance, the least fixed point. Okay, what is again a fixed point? Well, a fixed point is here a partial interpretation uh, that is more or less let's say, resistant to the application of the operator, that when you give it as an input to the operator, it is also produced as an output. So that's again just to recall fixed points. Okay, so what do we, what do we learn from these results from the literature? The first one is that the fitting semantics is indeed the least fitting fixed point. So what this actually means is that you can compute the least uh, fitting fixed point by starting from the empty interpretation, the one that assigns unknown to all the variables, and then iteratively applying the operator until you reach a, a, a partial interpretation, that is a fixed point of this computation, and you know then that this guy is the least fixed point of the fitting operator. 
So that al this also gives us more or less now a recipe to compute the least fit fixed point. And this guy is interesting, uh, coming to the second bullet, because the least fixed point, since it is least, is contained in all other fixed points of the fitting semantics, right? And now again, why is this interesting? Well, and this is now the, I think, the, the, a nice result that nicely closes actually the, the, the loop back to, pro, to program completion. The total fixed points of the fitting operator correspond to the supported models of the program. Right? So what this means now is we can actually compute the fitting semantics and we know that this is the least uh, fitting fixed point. And then we know actually that this, that everything that is true and false in the least fitting fixed point must also be true and false in the total fitting fixed point, which are the supported models. So this actually gives us, we can actually compute all the true and all the false atoms that are common to the supported models. Okay? Well, that looks com sounds complicated, but it's not. So let's look at an example. Here's again our running example along with its fitting semantics. We just learned that this fitting semantics is actually the same as the least uh, fitting fixed point of the program, that is, the least fixed point of the fitting operator associated with this program. So it contains A as a true atom and B and F as false atom. And what makes this least fixed point interesting is that its true and false atoms are contained in all other fixed points, in particular the total ones, and there are three of them. So these are the three total fixed points of the program, and we can easily verify that A is contained in the true atoms of all these total fixed points, and accordingly B and F are among the false atoms also of the total fixed points. But this is also this is not restricted to the total fixed points. This is a, a result valid for all fixed points. But the total ones are of particular interest because they correspond to the models of the completion of the program, namely the supported models. And you may remember actually from the previous part that there are three supported models, and these are actually the the true the true sets of atoms or the sets of true atoms of the three total fixed points. So I think this all fits together very nicely, but nonetheless the question is, we now played with these operators and all that, but what does it bring us in terms of the computation? How does this actually serve for building an ASP solver? And this is on the next slide, so stay tuned. Let us look briefly at the relation between a partial interpretation and the result of applying the fitting operator to it. That is, we have a partial interpretation with T and F, we apply the fitting operator to it and get a new partial interpretation T prime and F prime. Now, even though we changed our representation, keep in mind that a partial interpretation approximates stable models, right? And the first question uh, we have is whether this application actually preserves stable models. And the good news is, it does. Okay, so the fitting operator of a program preserves the stable models of the program. So what this means in a bit more formal terms, whenever you have a stable model uh, that actually encompasses the true elements of the partial interpretation and none of the false atoms of it, then this property also holds for the result of applying the fitting operator to it. That is, the obtained true atoms are contained in this stable model and the obtained none of the obtained false atom is contained in the stable model. So that's pretty cool and tells us that whenever we apply the fitting operator, we do not destroy any stable models, that is, we preserve them. As a result, we can use the fitting operator for propagation in ASP solvers. However, as we already know, right, uh, this does not go the full, uh, the full length because it falls short at some point. Because keep in mind that when we are at the end of a computation and we have a total fixed point, then the fitting operator cannot tell apart stable from supported models. So actually, we may end up in a computation with a supported model that is a, a fixed point of the fitting operator, and who will tell us that this actually is a stable model? Of course, the problem is the same as we discussed with program completion. It has, uh, it has to do with cyclic derivations. So the fitting operator cannot identify cyclic derivations at some point, right? And this is something we have to add to it to make it as strong as to be able to capture stable models. Okay, now let's just look at this briefly before we go on. 
So here's an example. So this is actually the, the, the common example with a, with a positive recursion. So A depends on B and B uh, depends on A. And this is an example where, again, we have uh, one stable model, which is empty because A and B are false, but there's also a supported model where A and B are true, right? So more or less there are two total uh, fitting fixed points of this, one where, uh, where A and B are true and one where A and B are false. So then computing the fitting semantics as the least, the least uh, fitting fixed point, we start with the, with the empty uh, interpretation and we get immediately a fixed point. So we can't actually say anything. We, don't, we can't deduce that A and B are false, or either of them, of course, right? So the fitting semantic is too weak to, to let us know or to, de to, 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 to detect that neither A nor B are derivable. Okay, so anyway, so this is more or less just to, to reiterate what we've already studied in depth when looking at program completion and loop formulas and, and this axiomatic characterization. It's just now in another disguise, in the disguise of these operators. Last but not least, let me provide you with another perspective on the fitting operator obtained by defining it in terms of the alternative representation of partial interpretations. So this is actually the representation where L is a lower bound and U is an upper bound. So L contains all atoms that have been found to be true and U contains all atoms that are still possible. Actually now the false atoms are represented implicitly. They are the ones outside of U in the complement of U or in the complement of the upper bound. Okay. Now, while doing this, we can now redefine uh, the fitting operator. First of all, we redefine or adapt more or less the sub-operator for the true atoms, right? So this is more or less a straightforward redefinition, just that now I use this other representation for partial interpretations. Again, we collect all heads of rules whose body applies. And this means now that, as before, the positive body is contained in the lower bound and all negative body literals have been found to be impossible. And I'm saying that like this because keep in mind the upper bound contains the possible atoms and all negative ones are, are, are beyond the, 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 the upper bound. So they're not even in the upper bound, so they must be false, right? That's more or less the major change uh, just coming from the adaption of the definition to, to this other representation of partial interpretations. Okay, now that we've done that, that's actually enough. We don't even need the second operator for the false ones because we can reuse this one. Okay, again, I'm overloading the symbol. I still call this guy phi now. And here it is. This is now the fitting operator in the disguise uh, of this different representation for partial interpretations. So as before, we plug in here the, the operator for the true atoms. And for the false atoms, we use the same operator, but we reverse the rules of the upper and the lower bound. That's pretty cool, right? And actually, I really love this characterization or this definition of the fitting uh, operator because I find it very elegant. But what it lacks, of course, is this direct relation to program completion. And that's actually why I choose the original definition, because this is really derived straight from the definition of program completion. And as, as, as said, right, since this is only an alternative definition, it has the same properties, right? So the least fixed points of, of, of this uh, operator here correspond to the fitting uh, semantics, and the total fixed points give us all the supported models of a program. Anyway, this is mainly food for thought, something for you to ponder about and perhaps to, to, to make you see other properties by looking at the fitting operator in a different way. Okay, now, before I was already talking about what the fitting operator lacks in the same way what program completion lacks. And now let's actually see how we can fix this by forbidding circular derivations. 